So it's, it's nice to see Dan again. We uh, uh, crossed paths about 10 years ago uh, during one of my gene therapy uh, uh, forays, and it's uh, nice to see him again. So I'm here to talk about Heplosav. Heplosav is our phase three uh, hepatitis B vaccine that we've developed at uh, Dynavax, and it's based on um, a TLR9 agonist that's a 20-tumor uh, oligonucleotide that is a TLR9 agonist, and that's the fundamental uh, utility of, uh, of our vaccine and the platform that we built this vaccine around. Uh, Dynavax was founded in 1997, uh, even before we understood what toll-like receptors really were, but based on some uh, immunologic phenomenology that later turned out to be TLR biology. So we now have programs involving uh, both the agonism and antagonism of TLRs 7 and 9, and we're beginning to work on TLR 8. So I'll briefly then move on to our vaccine. So current hepatitis B vaccines, there are two that are licensed in uh, uh, most of the Western world. They're based on recombinant uh, hepatitis B surface antigen produced in uh, yeast, and they contain uh, alum as their uh, adjuvanting material. They're typically administered to healthy adults as three doses over a six-month uh, period, given at month zero, one, and six. As I mentioned, our product uh, contains the same surface antigen, but it uh, includes this TLR9 uh, agonist. So here's a little cartoon of the TLR family. And uh, what you can see on the cartoon is there are toll-like receptors that reside on the uh, uh, plasma membrane, and then there are TLRs that reside on the endosome. And our target uh, of our company is TLR9, which you see at the bottom of the endosomal slide. It is uh, activated by CPG uh, motifs, and there are a variety of motifs that people have developed and looked at. Uh, we believe ours is the best, but uh, uh, one can, uh, uh, that's a separate argument for another day. Um, on the uh, cytosolic membrane, you see, for instance, uh, TLR4, which is the target for LPS, or MPL, which is uh, the uh, uh, particular active ingredient in uh, ASO4 which is the GSK adjuvant. Uh, you see TLR5 on there, which is a target of, of uh, for instance, vaccinate uh, uh, adjuvant. Uh, TLR3 is a target of uh, Vaxart's uh, uh, technology. So a variety of people are playing in this space, uh, uh, and we are one of them. So our product is uh, 20 micrograms of hepatitis B surface antigen, which is the same concentration as in the GSK product, combined with 3,000 micrograms, or 3 milligrams, of our uh, oligonucleotide, which we call 1018. In healthy adults, we give two doses on a zero and one month schedule. For persons that have chronic kidney disease, we give three doses on a zero, one, six schedule. That's compared to the Ingerex regimen of two doses at zero, one, two, and six months for that population. And of course, it's given as an intramuscular injection. This slide shows the clinical trials that we had conducted prior to the initiation of our current phase three program. And I just show it to make the point that we've been at this uh, for a while. Uh, clinical development of novel vaccines takes a bit, and ours uh, took, took a bit as well, uh, including an 18-month hiatus, which I'll discuss uh, later in the program. This shows our first phase three trial, which we conducted in uh, elderly adults uh, in Asia. And I just mentioned for uh, purposes of hepatitis B vaccine epidemiology, an elderly person is defined as one who's age 40 or over. So uh, many of us in this room uh, qualify. Um, in, this, in this particular trial, which was early in our program, we weren't sure that a two-dose regimen was going to work. So we gave uh, the, the Heplosav at zero, two, and six months compared to the zero, one, six schedule for Endurex. Um, you can see that by month three, the seroprotection rate in the Heplosav group was substantially different than that in the Endurex group, i.e. 97% to 23%. So it was subsequent to this trial that we realized we don't need to give the third dose and we could get by with a two-dose regimen. This slide shows the geometric mean uh, antibody concentrations from the same study, and the point is the same as the seroprotection slide shows, uh, higher, earlier, faster, better, compared to NGXB in healthy adults aged 40 to 70. We did a subset analysis looking at the younger elderly versus the elder elderly. And the point here is when we look at seroprotection, the uh, 
treatment benefit of Heplosab is maintained with age. However, for NGRX, you see the serial protection rate declined with age. That is 73% in subjects less than 55 years of age and 51 in subjects greater than 55 years of age. The same theme held true when you looked at geometric mean antibody concentrations. So this body of work then led us to conduct a phase three trial that we called FAST. Uh, and I wasn't part of the company at the time we chose that uh, name, so I don't know what the fancy acronym uh, was to stand for. Uh, I call it Study 10. Um, and this was a study in healthy adults aged 11 to 55 uh, years of age. Uh, as it turned out, from the regulatory perspective, uh, two of the three countries that this trial was to be conducted in uh, did not want us to go uh, below the age of 18, but one country um, felt very strongly that we needed to go below the age of 18, and that was Canada. So uh, due to the inclusion of Canadian subjects in this trial, the trial was 11 to 55. However, only six subjects under the age of 18 enrolled in the study. So for purposes of discussion, I will call it an 18 to 55 uh, trial. The primary efficacy variable was serial protection rate, as I showed you in the earlier slide. And the primary endpoint was the difference in serial protection rate between Heplosav and NGRX B. Our hypothesis was that two doses of Heplosav would be not inferior to three doses of NGRX B. So there were uh, 2,428 subjects were enrolled at 21 sites in Canada and Germany. It turned out we did not include subjects from the U.S. in this trial because uh, when we met with the FDA, they felt uncomfortable with us going straight into a phase three population without having done previous trials in the U.S. So they asked us to do a phase two trial in the U.S. first, and by the time we uh, completed the phase two trial, the trial was completely enrolled. So only subjects in Canada and Germany were involved. Uh, they were randomized three to one between Heplosav and NGRX B. It's an observer blind study, and it is observer blind because uh, the Heplosav vaccine is clear, uh, whereas the NGRX vaccine contains alum, so it's a, more of a milky color, and we did not blind the placebo barrels. That said, we had blinded vaccine administrators. The pharmacist uh, was not involved, who, who mixed, uh, mixed the vaccines and provided the vaccines to the staff, uh, was not involved in any of their observations. The administrator of the vaccine was not involved in other uh, observations, and we asked subjects to turn their head away so that they would not see the vaccine that was being given to them. Nonetheless, we still call this an observer-blind uh, study, uh, not a double-blind study. But the only potential for bias is if, in fact, people could discriminate between a uh, one mil injection, which is the injection volume for NGREX, and a half mil injection volume, which is the injection volume for our product. 2,101 subjects uh, were eligible for the per protocol population. And in this case, the appropriate analysis for the primary endpoint is per protocol, because we're giving two doses compared to three. So if we uh, did a, a modified intent to treat analysis as the primary endpoint, there could be a bias in that subjects in our treatment group don't need dose three, and subjects in the other group did need dose three. So here's the results um, from the study. And as with the previous trial, uh, blue is Heplosav, orange is NGREX, and you can see by month two, the serial protection rate is 89% in the Heplosav group, 26% in the NGREX group. The primary endpoint are the green stars, that is the month three serial protection rate for Heplosav compared to the month seven serial protection rate for NGREX B. And that difference is 95% to 81%. All of the uh, uh, two-way comparisons at each time point were highly significant, as was the primary endpoint. So the difference in serial protection rate between the two groups was 13.8%, the 95% confidence interval. The lower bound was 10.5%. Therefore, we demonstrated non-inferiority because it excluded a negative 10% a difference. And because the lower bound of the 95% confidence interval excluded zero, we can claim superiority. We did a subset analysis by age here. So now we've got those subjects under the age of 40. Uh, compared to those subjects over the age of 40. And the, the theme is the same as I showed you before. That is, Heplosab maintains its effectiveness across age. Uh, NGREX begins to decline with age. And that's not a new phenomenon. There was a very nice publication by Averoff et al. from the CDC back in 1992 that showed this age-dependent uh, decline in seroprotection rate uh, amongst uh, healthy adults. In that particular case, it was a, a set of healthcare workers. This slide shows the geometric mean antibody concentrations over time. And again, you can see that uh, we're higher and earlier by month seven, which is one month post the last dose of NGREX, and now uh, six months post the last dose of Heplosav, the GMCs are uh, identical. 
We did a subset analysis uh, looking at diabetics in this trial. There has been a recent conversation at the ACIP regarding the need for uh, immunization of diabetics against hepatitis B infection. And this is related to the fact that over the last five years, the most common source of institutionalized hepatitis B epidemics has been in uh, adults with diabetes living in assisted uh, living facilities. So these are these, uh, you know, like sort of an apartment community uh, that's designed for elders. Uh, but not officially a nursing home or a hospital. And as a result, uh, the mechanism of transmission is shared uh, blood glucose testing equipment. Uh, and in this population, it's a really an important problem uh, where they've identified these, these epidemics. The mortality rate amongst diabetics has been up to 20%. So the diabetics have a higher incidence of hepatitis B infection at any age group based on NHANES data. Uh, they respond less well to hepatitis B vaccine. When they are infected, they have a more uh, uh, serious prognosis. And as a result, we wanted to do a subset analysis from study 10. So I want to be clear, this was not a prospectively defined endpoint. We went back and looked at subjects in our database who had either diabetes mellitus as a uh, medical history at baseline or who were on concomitant medications for diabetes mellitus. And that's how we identified this particular group of subjects. So 45 hepless ab subjects compared to 17 indirect subjects uh, were identified, and that's consistent with our three to one uh, treatment group assignment for the trial overall. And the primary endpoint, again, was that month three to month seven comparison, which I showed you on the previous slide. And here in this small subset, this difference is statistically significant, 84% versus 35%. I'm going to move on now to patients with chronic kidney disease. Uh, our Data going into the phase three trial that we're conducting now involved about 75 uh, subjects, so it's a relatively small database compared to what I've showed you for the healthy adult uh, database. Here's results from the first of our two uh, small pilot studies in this, in, uh, in this population. And uh, here again, the regimen is Heplosav, a single dose at zero, one, and six months, compared to a double dose of Endurex at zero, one, two, and six months. And as you can see, the theme is the same as with the healthy adults. That is, an earlier uh, protection rate uh, in HEPLASAB recipients. Uh, and at the end of the day, there is no difference between the uh, 96 and 88 uh, percent rates in this trial, in a small uh, pilot trial, if we use the serial protection rate of 10. Now, in Europe in particular, there's an interest in using a higher serial protection rate because di uh, people with chronic kidney disease tend to also not respond well to vaccine, and they tend to not have an anamnestic response if they see the virus uh, again. And so there's a, an interest to always keep these subjects uh, uh, antibody level above the 10 level. So they're, they're reboosted uh, if they're found to be less than 10. And so in some uh, regions, they prefer to look at a threshold of 100 for initial vaccination. So we also did that analysis in this particular set. And here, in fact, this uh, difference at month seven and month 12, using the more stringent threshold, is significant between the two groups, with 89% and 63% at month seven, 86% and 33% at month 12. This slide shows the geometric mean antibody concentrations, and it's the same thing that I mentioned to you before, higher, earlier, et cetera. So I'm going to move into the safety conversation. And there's a really interesting, uh, well, interesting may not be the, quite the right word to use. Uh, yeah, perhaps it is. Uh, safety event that occurred in this phase three trial that I discussed before. So overall, uh, it's our contention that the safety profile of Heplosav is similar to that of Indrex B. Local and systemic reactogenicity events, adverse events, serious adverse events occurred at similar rates between the groups. Events possibly associated with autoimmunity were rare and occurred at similar rates between uh, the two groups. And two cases of ANC-associated vasculitis occurred during this large phase three study that I just, uh, just mentioned to you, the study 10. So I'm going to walk you through um, these data. So in study 10, two cases of ANC-associated vasculitis occurred uh, in subjects, one in each of the treatment groups. So that's one in 1,800 of the Heplosav subjects, one in 600 of the uh, Indirect subjects. Uh, that's a result in a p-value of 0.43. One subject developed p vasculitis or microscopic polyangiitis, and that subject was in the Endurex treatment group. So that's a rate of zero out of 1,800 compared to one out of 600, p-value of 0.25. One subject developed c vasculitis or Wegener's granulomatosis, and that subject was in the Heplosav group. One out of 1,800, zero out of 600, p-value of one. 
I just want to be clear that's p-value of 1, not 0.1 or 0.01, it's 1. So our conclusion, based on these event rates, is that there was no apparent difference in the occurrence of ANC-associated vasculitis, microscopic polyangiitis, or Wegener's granulomatosis between the two uh, treatment groups. However, um, that said, there is a general concern that novel adjuvants might provoke autoimmune disease. The program was put on clinical hold when the case of Wegener's granulomatosis occurred, and it was an 18-month clinical hold. And, you know, it's an unusual thing for a, a product to go on clinical hold for safety in phase three and ever get, at, ever get out of that. Uh, so I want to walk through how we uh, worked with the FDA to get out of that and then get back on track to where we're now uh, completing two large phase three studies. So the case of Wegener's granulomatosis occurred in a 55-year-old white female uh, native German who was enrolled in study 10. No significant uh, past medical history of, the, of any, any import. Uh, three weeks after the first vaccination, I'm sorry, vaccination happened on, on July 3 of 2007. Three weeks later, the subject had widespread urticaria three hours after having had a meal. This uh, urticaria lasted for about 60 minutes and went away. So it was, it was attributed to a food reaction. I, I won't, uh, won't argue the validity of that, uh, uh, of that assessment. On August 2nd, four weeks later, they got their second dose of Heplosav. On August 13th through 17th, the subject reported a hoarse voice. And on October 13th, the subject uh, was found to have chronic sinusitis, was evaluated, found to have uh, septal deviation, underwent septoplasty uh, for uh, uh, that particular problem, and that was resolved when they came back for their next visit on December 11th. On December 11th was the third uh, vaccination, and because they were heplosav subject, they received placebo at that visit. One month later, the subject developed fever. A few days later, they were hospitalized for Wegener's granulomatosis. The hospitalization lasted about a month. The patient was quite ill, including a significant amount of time in the intensive care unit. And uh, uh, they came out, of, uh, as I said, one month later. And in June of that year, the, sub the subject's symptoms had resolved after treatment with prednisone and cyclophosphamide, according to the uh, PI. Subsequent to that, the patient has invoked their privacy rights under German law. We have no further access to the records of this subject. So as a result of this case, as I mentioned, uh, we were put on clinical hold by the FDA. We underwent a series of uh, assessments to determine uh, whether, in fact, there was a safety risk associated with our vaccine um, or not. So the first thing we did is we tested ANCA antibodies in all of the subjects for whom we had available sera. Uh, one of the hypotheses that, we, uh, that occurred to us is that perhaps we had induced uh, a pandemic of ANC antibodies, or an epidemic in this case, of ANC antibodies, only one subject of whom might have developed disease. But if we found, for instance, 10 subjects who had ANC antibodies, that would be quite disconcerting to us. So we took sera from all the uh, studies where we had them available, study 10, which is the large study I mentioned, study 14, which is the phase two study the FDA asked us to do prior to uh, going on study 10, so that had about 200 subjects in it, and study 11 uh, was a, one of the small uh, chronic kidney disease studies that I mentioned earlier. We looked at, at uh, three time points, screening month three and month seven. Since these were our uh, primary immunogenicity time points, we had extra sera from all subjects at all of these visits, and so here are the results. We looked at 9,338 samples for ANCA antibody. This is now the largest collection of sera that have been tested for ANCA antibody in the world. Um, and that testing algorithm was as follows. We first looked for ELISA antibodies to either my myeloperoxidase or protein H3. If a subject had a positive ELISA for either protein, then we did uh, the confirmatory testing by uh, IFA, standard uh, testing al algorithm. Out of the 2024 Heplosab subjects who had sera available, and I want to say before we go into this, both the MPA subject and the Endrex group and the Wegener subject are not included in this analysis because we uh, exhausted all of their sera and other testing that we'd done before we got to this point. So they're not in this assessment. Two subjects had positive ELISA for PR3 in the Heplosab group and two for myeloperoxidase. None of them were positive uh, by IFA staining. For NGREX, two subjects were positive for PR3, none for myeloperoxidase. One of the PR3 positive subjects uh, did light up on immunofluorescence assay. However, the staining was neither cytoplasmic nor perinuclear. It was what is called a typical staining. So in fact, that's considered to be uh, not a positive test. So the point of this slide is neither vaccine induced uh, uh, an epidemic of ANCA antibodies in this clinical trial population. 
So, but of course, no one really, the, 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 the safety hypothesis wasn't really that our vaccine might be associated with Wegener's. The real hypothesis was that our vaccine might provoke autoimmune disease. So the next assessment that we did was looking at all subjects in the database to date who had developed autoimmune disease, a new diagnosis of autoimmune disease while on clinical trial. So there are 2,500 subjects in the HEPLOSAB database at this point in time, or at the time that this slide was made, uh, seven of whom had, had had some sort of autoimmune disease develop while they were on study. So that's an event rate of 0.28%. For NGRXB, there were four cases out of 930 subjects. That's an event rate of 0.43%. So when one typically is interested in this kind of analysis, one looks at relative risk. So the relative risk of developing autoimmune disease in the HEPLOSAB group versus the NTRIX group is 0.65. The upper bound of the 95% confidence interval, which is shown on the, uh, below the, the uh, percents on each slide, for HEPLOSAB, the upper bound is 0.58. So if one takes 0.58 divided by 0.3 to develop the upper bound of the relative risk, that uh, uh, turns out to be 1.35. And just to put that in context, uh, for the Merck uh, rotavirus vaccine study, the predefined upper bound for the 95% confidence interval was a relative risk of 10. So 1.3 is a very low uh, relative risk for the upper bound of the confidence interval. And this was a very important piece of data that we shared with the agency to, to move forward. There's really no evidence for uh, increased risk of autoimmune disease. Finally, because our uh, adjuvant is a 20-tumor oligo, we've considered from the beginning of the program that testing for anti-double-stranded DNA might be an important uh, safety biomarker. So anti-double-stranded DNA is, uh, is one of the antibodies that best correlates with lupus. Lupus has a relatively frequent uh, autoimmune disease, um, and our, there's a, a theoretical mechanistic link between our product and double-stranded DNA antibodies, so we thought, and the agency agreed, this would be a good biomarker to look at. So we've been collecting, you know, throughout most of our trials, uh, anti-double-stranded DNA data at baseline and at study exit. So the important uh, cell here is the second uh, set of cells, that is the subjects who were negative at study entry and positive at study exit. And you can see that 0.5% of HEPLOSAV subjects fit that profile compared to 0.6% of NGRXB subjects. So again, there's no evidence for an increased risk of HEPLOSAV inducing anti-double-stranded DNA antibodies compared to NGRXB. So it was the, the, the combination of those three uh, analyses that led to us coming off clinical hold and moving into the new, uh, the new phase three trials. There are two large trials that we're conducting at present, and I was asked some questions about this yesterday, so I'll just take a little bit of time to briefly uh, comment on those, on those designs. The fundamentally uh, new thing that we've done is we have now have active surveillance for autoimmune disease. So we developed a questionnaire based on the American College of Rheumatology classification criteria for autoimmune disease, that questionnaire is delivered to subjects at every single study visit. We have monthly study visits with 12-month follow-up. So these aren't phone calls. These are direct uh, physician, uh, uh, investigator, subject interactions at each visit. So it's a very intense active surveillance program. If they meet the criteria uh, for a potential classification of autoimmune disease, they're then sent off to a rheumatologist for expert evaluation. And the rationale for that is that I thought many of our investigators might be as good at diagnosing lupus as I am. I'm an infectious disease physician. If we relied on my diagno diagnostic skills to determine the incidence rate, we would uh, probably miss the mark. And therefore, we wanted to have this extra uh, level of, uh, of insight. All cases that are then confirmed by a rheumatologist go off to our safety endpoint adjudication committee, which is a, a group of three experts at the Mayo Clinic who review all cases. And then we have a DSMB who looks at, uh, or at least who has the uh, opportunity to look at the accumulation of cases by treatment group. So it's this very aggressive, intensive surveillance that allows us at the end of these studies to be able to say, uh, in, a, in a stronger way, there's no increased risk of autoimmune disease than we can at present based on our passive surveillance in the previous trials. So the two large phase three trials we have is the lot to lot consistency trial in healthy adults over the age of 40. Last patient out for that trial is in May. Uh, I had hoped that it might be a little bit uh, earlier than that so that we could say something here, but we can't. Uh, so it, uh, trial ends in May, probably have data late June, early July. Our chronic kidney disease uh, trial is a 600 subject trial, one to one randomization between NGRX and HEPLASAV, and that study will hit its primary endpoint in July. So that's where we are, and uh, we're hoping that uh, uh, we'll be able to file a BLA and MAA uh, by the end of the year. So, with that said, I'm happy to answer any questions if there's time, Dan.
Nick. So, um, I, I don't know whether you're familiar with it, but there's a local company, uh, ABL, here who, who do DNA vaccination. And certainly, um, in some small studies in HIV, where they were giving, I think, eight milligrams of DNA, they saw some florid cases of vasculitis that, that you know, because these they were very small numbers, um, uh, were highly significantly associated with the vaccine. So do you think that, that, that you know, there may be an issue between the dose of um, CPG and, and the risk of vasculitis? Yeah, you know, I, I don't really want to comment on, on, on their product. Yeah. Dose could obviously be one difference potentially. Um, uh, you know, sequ there's, there's all kinds of variables that, that could play into that. So the only comment that I want to make is that, you know, in a relatively large data set of 2,500 humans, we don't see a, an increased risk. Um, that said, it's an important concern, and that's why we did the analysis that, we, that we've done. Yeah. Oh. Do you want to wait for the mic? Thank you. With uh, hepatitis B being so prevalent in Asia, I was just curious, uh, with the trials that you have, what are the regulatory hurdles you have to get approval in Japan and China, Korea? Yeah, it's, it's, it's an excellent question. Um, you know, there are uh, different rules in, of course, all the different uh, geographies. Um, and as a general rule, it's, you know, having a license uh, in, the, in, in the West enables getting a license in, in the various Asian countries. There are some, uh, some uh, exceptions to that. So, for instance, Singapore is one that is that has developed a very uh, robust regulatory structure and is looking for um, uh, the opportunity to uh, create approvals based on their own review as opposed to stamping others others reviews. That said, our current uh, uh, in intentions are to license the product in in Europe and and in the U.S. first. getting similar types of requirements. Yeah, we, we actually haven't, uh, we, we haven't rigorously pursued uh, conversations with those agencies. You know, we're a small emerging biotech, we have to focus, and so we focused on uh, uh, FDA Health Canada and EMA. With that comment on regulatory approvals, Tyler, can you, could you describe sort of the commercialization strategy? You, you yeah. Identified some clear advantages of the yep. vaccine. But uh, yeah. what, what indication are you, are you going after first? Yeah, so uh, we're initially uh, seeking a, a three indications, the indication being for subjects with chronic kidney disease defined as a GFR less than 45, uh, all subjects over the age of 40 who need protection from hepatitis B vaccine, and subjects uh, over the age of 18 who need rapid protection. So the distinction about rapid protection are those who are actually significantly at risk versus those who for you know, programmatic or bureaucratic reasons are immunized, but the, the uh, incidence of infection in those groups are low. So for instance, um, uh, people with multiple sex partners or people who are intravenous drug users have a high risk and therefore time to protection is, is important and critical. And in fact, it's actually where the most of the cases occur. Whereas say your typical uh, person entering uh, medical school who's going to someday take care of patients and therefore need to be protected two years from now, time isn't such an important variable for that person. So that, that's the label that we're currently discussing. Okay. Well, let's thank Tyler again. Thank you.